It is my very great pleasure and, part and privilege to introduce the participants in today's session. Our main speaker is Professor Nicholas Walters Torf with a T, formerly of Kelvin College for many years, Yale Divinity School, and now to be found at the University of Virginia. And the comments to be given by Professor Louise Antony, now at the U UMass at Amherst, and the editor of that volume, Philosophers Without Gods. Thank you. I've been having some trouble with laryngitis, so um, my voice may just fade away at a certain point in this presentation. I'm going to have to skip big chunks of this. It's too long to read. I did not, um, my, my pagination is different from what's in the book, so I won't be able to tell you to what page to leap, but um, I'll do, you my, do my best to give you um, clues. Yahweh, mighty king, lover of justice, declaims the psalmist. And Abraham asks rhetorically, shall not you, Yahweh, the judge of all the earth, do what is just? How then can Yahweh authorize Joshua and his army to slaughter everybody in the city of Hazor? The Lord is just and upright. All his ways are just, sings Moses. How then can that same Moses, speaking on behalf of that same God, tell Israel to utterly destroy the seven nations? Love your enemies, said Jesus, so that you may be children of God, your Father in heaven. How then can Moses, speaking in the name of that same God, enjoin Israel to show no mercy to the seven nations? We understate when we say that those of us who are Jewish readers of Hebrew scripture or Christian readers of Christian scripture, for us, there is a serious problem here. The problem is not that we have absorbed modern enlightened views about ethical and theological matters and are on that account morally offended by the picture of genocidal slaughter in Israel's conquest of the land, as reported in the book of Joshua, and religiously offended by the picture in Deuteronomy of God as enjoining such slaughter. If that were the problem that we picked up these modern ideas and now reading this stuff, we could join other modern enlightened people and simply dismiss these writings as the products of a bloodthirsty pre-modern era. Though before we settle into smug self-righteousness, we had better remind ourselves of the horrors that modern enlightened people perpetrated in the 20th century. For those of us who are Jews or Christians, the problem isn't that, it's different. It's twofold. Joshua is part of our canon whatever we make of canon. So we cannot simply toss it out. And we have been formed in our understanding of God by the biblical acclamations of God as just and loving, and shaped in our ethical thinking by the biblical injunctions to do justice and to love even the enemy. It is as so formed and so shaped that we're both offended and baffled by what we read in the book of Joshua. Thanks very much, Louise. The commands that Joshua is reported in Deuteronomy, that God is reported in Deuteronomy and Joshua is issuing, seem in flagrant conflict with what we have learned about God from the descriptions and acclamations that we find at other places in those same scriptures. In my book, Justice, Rights, and Wrongs, I spent some time articulating how justice is understood in the Hebrew and Christian Bibles. I highlighted, among other things, the intimate connection repetitively drawn between the presence of justice in society and the fate of the socially vulnerable, widows, orphans, aliens, and the impoverished. But I did not take the next step of asking how we are to understand the fact that some of God's actions as presented in scripture seem patently unjust on scripture's own understanding of justice. So that's what I propose doing in this essay, taking the nettle in hand. Obviously, I won't have time to consider all the problematic cases. I will focus on what everyone agrees are the most egregious purported examples of divine injustice, the genocidal slaughter that God has presented in the book of Joshua as having enjoined Israel to perpetrate in the conquest of the promised land. To prepare the ground for my own address to the problem, 
I want to look first at a contemporary interpretation of Joshua, that of the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann in his recent book, Divine Presence and Violence, contextualizing the book of Joshua, and that, uh, then at a traditional interpretation, that of John Calvin in his commentary on Joshua. Now let's skip quite a few pages until you get an indented quotation following which you find the words, the textual clue. For Brueggemann, the textual clue to his interpretation, textual clue to the fact that Israel, as he sees it, is up against a league of oppressive monopolistic monarchies, is the reference in the text of Joshua to horses and chariots. They came out with all their troops, a great army, with very many horses and chariots. Brueggemann explains the import of the phrase horses and chariots as follows. Following the general analysis of Gottwald, the city-states are to be understood as monopolies of socioeconomic political power that are managed in hierarchical and oppressive ways. Horses and chariots reflect the strength and monopoly of arms that are necessary and available for the maintenance of the economic and political monopoly. By contrast, Israel, being an agrarian peasant movement, has no horses and chariots. And at many points in the Old Testament Bible, not just in Joshua, Israel is warned against depending on horses and chariots. So in verse 6 of Joshua 11, we read that the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of Hazor and its allies, for tomorrow at this time I will hand over all of them slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. What we have here, says Brueggemann, is the disclosure that Yahweh gave permission to, for Joshua and Israel to act for their justice and liberation against an oppressive adversary. The revelatory word of Yahweh, given directly without conduit or process, is only authorization for a liberating movement, which is sure to be violent, but only violent against weapons, horses and chariots. What is revealed is that Yahweh is allied with the marginalized or pressed peasants against the monopoly of the city-state. Now let's skip a <coughs> half a page. So Brueggemann's suggestion is that in his perpetration of violence against the inhabitants of Hazor and his allies, Joshua and his troops went far beyond Yahweh's mandate. Brueggemann observes that Yahweh's only direct speech in Joshua 11 occurs in verse 6, what I just quoted. So that speech, he says, is the normative revelation within the text. It mandates destruction of a quite specific kind in order to give liberated Israel room to exist. It sanctions neither more nor less than this. One may imagine that Israel took that limited disciplined warrant of Yahweh and went well beyond its intent or substance in its action out of rage and oppression. So Yahweh does indeed mandate violence, but only of a specific kind, tightly circumscribed. And that is what you and I, says Brueggemann, outside the narrative should appropriate millennia later as its revelatory claim. The, Bush of Joshua, the book of Joshua, rather than offending the understanding of justice that we have gleaned from scripture, presents a vivid application of that understanding. The God of the tradition is passionately against domination and is passionately for an egalitarian community. Well, if this interpretation of Joshua is plausible and can plausibly be employed as the, her as the hermeneutic key to the other stories of conquest in the book, it would solve most of our moral and theological concerns. The book of Joshua, to speak a bit anachronistically, though know, this is how Brueggemann puts it, would be a story of liberation theology and action, along with reports of some all too human excesses engendered by rage at oppression. Now I've got to skip my discussion as to why I think that interpretation of Brueggemann does not text, work textually as an interpretation of the text. Let us skip all the way to section three. Let us now to, turn to an exa example of a traditional theological, interpre theological interpretation of Joshua, that of John Kelvin. Unlike Brueggemann, who concentrates on explicating the world of the text while making no explicit 
commitments as to the extent to which the world of the text fits the real world, Calvin took for granted that the text tells us what actually happened. Of course, to find out from the text what actually happened, we must interpret it correctly. And in the course of his commentary, Calvin does not shrink from declaring that the text is sometimes hyperbolic, that on some points it doesn't matter whether it's fully accurate, and that on some points we are left with what seem to be incompatible claims. Calvin is pretty loose about all that. But Calvin never so much as considers the possibility that the text as a whole does not claim that Yahweh commanded Joshua and his troops to exterminate the seven nations. Thus, the way of dealing with our question that Brueggemann pursued, Joshua, that God didn't claim it, is not open to him. It was, says Calvin, because, of the iniquity, because the iniquity of the nations had reached its height that God determined to destroy them. This was, he says, the origin of the command given to Moses. By using Israel as his agent, Yahweh could thus at one and the same time fulfill his promise to give Israel a land of its own, and purge the land of Canaan of the foul and loathsome defilements by which it had been long polluted. Now let's skip about a page. Calvin realizes that the fact that Yahweh chose not to exterminate the nations present in the land by some act of God, but rather by employing Israel as his agent, raised some problems, potential or actual. For it was and is, says Calvin, God's will that nations act justly in their prosecution of warfare. 